launch of the book A Princely Affair, Accession and Integration of the Princely States of Pakistan, 1947 to 1955 by Mr. Yaqub Khan Bangash. Uh, the moderator for this uh, discussion is Mr. Hafiz Jamali. Dr. Hafiz Jamali is an academic with eclectic research and teaching interest. He holds a PhD in sociocultural anthropology from the University of Texas, Austin, as well as an MPA from the University of Victoria, Canada. He presently teaches at Habib University, Karachi, endeavoring to help his students develop a critical theoretical apparatus and an interdisciplinary approach towards understanding contemporary society. The session is now yours, sir. Thank you for that uh, generous intro introduction. And I see that you are still not tired of introducing me at the third <laughs> panel. So I really appreciate <laughs> your patience. <laughs> she must know it by heart now. <laughs> yes. There and um, also, the, hopefully, I won't test the patience of my two guests here, uh, Dr. Yaqub Khan Bangash and Professor Barbara D. Metcalf. Uh, both very eminent historians, and I, you know, to, uh, to quote uh, Bernard Cohn, and I'm an anthropologist among two historians, so <laughs> <laughs> I hope it goes well with them. Um, uh, Dr. Yaqub Khan Bangash, uh, who is the author of um, A Princely Affair, uh, Accession of Princely States uh, to Pakistan, uh, is, a, is an eminent historian who teaches at um, uh, Foreman Christian uh, you know, college university, FC University in Lahore, and uh, is uh, right. You are a visiting professor right now at. Uh, uh, the well, I've joined ITU now. So you are formally joined. So, so I've oh. left FC College. <laughs> okay, just a few okay. Because ago. that's I'm working on previous knowledge. On the previous, well, just a few yeah. months. Yeah. Uh, he has a, a BA from uh, Notre Dame and uh, a DPhil in history from Oxford. And his dissert, the book we are discussing is based on his dissertation uh, work, if I understand it correctly. Uh, he has uh, written uh, scholarly uh, articles on uh, history and historiography before, and has also written uh, in the, uh, um, as a public intellectual in newspapers and magazines. Um, um, the, uh, just a, a brief word about the book itself, and you know, then I will uh, like my eminent guests to speak to it more. Um, uh, this is one of the first um, uh, formal treatments of uh, princely states accession to Pakistan, and I don't know if anyone, I'm not familiar in, in Indian context, has, has, has any work has been done in well, India? A lot of books in India have been published on the princely states, but you know. Certainly not the, on Pakistan. Yeah, not, not, not on Pakistan. So uh, in that because. sense, in that sense, it makes a very important uh, historical and historiographical intervention and uh, fills an important gap in our knowledge of uh, the making of uh, the subcontinent and specifically the nation building enterprise in uh, colonial and post colonial Pakistan. Um, uh, and it has rich material on uh, some of the major princely states, including uh, the Khanate of Kalat and uh, the princely states of Khairpur and Bahawalpur, as well as uh, Gilgit Hunza, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, and our other guest today is, uh, to comment on the book, is uh, Professor Barbara D. Metcalf, who is in, uh, who's one of the most well-known historians of South Asia. Uh, she is currently Emeritus Professor of History at University of California, Davis. And uh, she has previously served as the Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at UC Davis, as well as a distinguished professor of history at University of Michigan. Her primary work has been on the uh, colonial history and historiography of South Asia, South Asia focusing especially on South Asian Muslims. Uh, her dissertation work was on the uh, uh, foundation and the role of the famous seminary at Deoband in the making of uh, uh, Muslim uh, identity and attitudes in colonial India. And uh, her, she has also, in addition to uh, her uh, scholarly output, she has also served uh, as a past president of the American Historical Association as well as the America, as well as the Asian Studies, uh, Society for Asian Studies. Um, so uh, I, without uh, further ado, I would first like to um, call on Dr. Uh, Barbara Metcalf to uh, 
perhaps give us an overview of the larger problematic of uh, the, um, the role of princely states within uh, uh, modern histo colonial historiography and, uh, and the book itself. Thank you very much, Hafiz. It really is a, an enormous pleasure to be here. And I begin by offering my congratulations to the author for a, a book that really does uh, not only fill the void that Hafiz has already alluded to, but really makes a contribution, I think, to a couple of huge themes in current historical writing. And in fact, one of those is a really fascinating new interest in the princely states, which without any question have been a neglected area in the historiography of modern South Asia. They never fit very comfortably into the overall nationalist narrative. They weren't part, heart, they weren't central uh, at, at a certain level to nationalism. In some ways they were an embarrassment to the colonial, to the anti-colonial movement because they were seen as so much an obstacle allied with the British. And that has changed dramatically in the last decade or so with really uh, path-breaking work on Baroda, Mysore, Hyderabad, uh, the Rajasthan states, but not on the states that were going to become part of India, were going to become part of Pakistan. It's the Indian states that have been primarily emphasized. And so obviously, for starts, this is an extremely uh, important contribution. And the work that has been done has, I think, gone in several directions. In some of the cases, we have uh, very advanced states, as they were understood, that were making kinds of progress that were unknown in British India. In some of the states, we have examples of different kinds of sovereignty that we did not have in, the, in India as a whole, whether it was particular forms of legitimacy and kingship or claims on certain kinds of autonomy. There were also some extremely important um, political experiments, of which ones coming out of Hyderabad with a vision of a secular state. There's one of the most interesting books that, from my point of view of this new literature is, is uh, the vision of Osmania University mm. and secular, uh, 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 and Urdu as a secular language that could be the, nat natural la the national language of India. So let us, you know, t first place this book in that context of work on the princely states. Turns out that the Pakistan case has fabulously interesting variations to the point that Yaqub Khan suggests that what is taken as the classic typology of princely states, old provinces, uh, the original Vatan Jagirs of the Mughals, uh, the conquest states of Marathas, that these states don't fit that three-part typology that we've always taken for granted, um, above all because of, of, well, of a range of, of, of characteristics of one is, is their tribal basis. But there is a very arresting contrast with which he begins the book. Essentially, at independence in India, the princes lost their titles and rights. And with states reorganization, even their role as titular governors were gone. By the end of 71, their privy, privy purses, their last privilege was gone. And in Pakistan, I certainly had not known this, as late as 2009, the maintenance allowance of the erstwhile princes, more or less privy purses, were increased 200% by virt with virtually no discussion. The princes, he tells us, still hold diplomatic passports. They still receive tax breaks. Fascinating. So what was going on? Was Nehru right that the Muslim League, and by extension its successors, was nothing but a coalition of privileged landlords and the wealthy? Uh, Jinnah not hostile to the princes himself? There's a little bit of that, which I'll get to in a minute, but the story turns out to be far more complicated. And I would say above all, although there certainly were challenges in the integration to some of the states in India, the story was far more difficult, 
I think it's fair to say, in Pakistan. And that's what we have in this extremely interesting book in detail. Um, and here is where I would place the book in another context of recent historiography. And that is the historiography that, le that wants to stand outside uh, the official, the stereotypical story of Pakistani nationalism as the expression of the hopes and aspirations of the Muslim community. And instead, a recognition of the multiplicity of interests, including deep opposition to Pakistan, not only by groups that remained outside Pakistan's borders, but by some that, who remained within. The states were, as India did not have to contend with, in most cases, or in many cases, frontier states, border states. Populations with even irredentist, but certainly close ties to Afghans or Afga Afga Afghanistan or Iran, always risking some kind of intervention. So we begin to see a need to accommodate the interests of the princes. It's not only political, but deeply cultural, so that we have states that looked toward Afghanistan or for the Baluch to Iran and the Gulf. This is a fascinating difference. Secondly, these are tribal states with virtually no experience of political uh, participation, let alone political infrastructure. And again, in some of the pr other princely states, we had highly elaborated political, not certainly not much in the way of democracy, but political institutions beginning to emerge, including incipient nationalist movements. Here, the only state that had interwar activism was geared to Baluch regionalism. This is Kalat, so that by independence, the preference was either for India or independence. Fascinating, obviously a challenge. And Pakistan had yet another issue, and that was what one can refer to as an underdeveloped ideology for the country as a whole. And so the move to democracy, even the creation of the Constitution, came more slowly. And what we wound up with, with the princely state, was a kind of uh, uh, divided uh, sovereignty so that, the so that the states did not have to be incorporated from day one into universal suffrage, into participation in democracy as a whole. This is also a very interesting and challenging uh, uh, context for the integration of these states. And as this is already, as I've already hinted with these border interests of necessity, perhaps, security had to trump democracy. I'm virtually quoting a line from the book when I say that. The princes, to some extent, were seen as bastions of support. So the opening vignette and my comment on it has a, some validity to the point that chapter four of the book refers to the Raj resurrected in the sense that accommodations are made to princes in the interest of what, in the pre presumed interest of stability and security. And what that meant was there was an acceptance of different degrees of sovereignty instead of uh, unification. And finally, um, I suppose that means that a kind of a third body of scholarship that this book speaks to, beyond the princely states generally, behind the kind of defamiliarizing of the narrative of, of Pakistan, has to do with political history, because the this, this story culminates in the creation of one unit. And I think one of the really important contributions to South Asian history in general has come from someone well known to many of us, Ayesha Jalal, who has consistently argued that the interests of the people of this entire uh, subcontinent are best served in decentralized 
systems. And here instead, with, with one unit, we have the attempt to erase regional difference rather than to accommodate them. So this book seems to me um, extremely important in a theme that we've, has come up in a number of our discussions over the last couple of days. And that is the importance of being clear-eyed about the past and what may appear to be, in some ways, a critique of Pakistan's mythology is actually a contribution um, to its civic culture and to its citizens. Thank you very much uh, for those enlightened comments, Dr. Metcalf. Now I would uh, uh, invite uh, the author of the book, uh, Dr. Yaqub Khan Bangash, to tell us a little bit about his inspiration for writing the book and his intellectual trajectory before we try to take questions, if any. Uh, thank, thank you for that. And I must say uh, thank you very much, Pro Professor Metcalf. It's an honor. Uh, that a senior scholar like you has actually uh, commented on the book and uh, liked, liked it, you know, that was my first scare in saying, well, if you give it to a, a very senior, senior scholar, they will see all the holes in it, uh, which, uh, of course, there are many. So thank you very much for those kind words and for contextualizing it better than I could have actually done. Um, well, one thing that I just want to show you earlier is, uh, if you look at that really badly drawn map, that's my attempt at drawing a map, that is actually Pakistan on Independence Day. Uh, uh, of course, I don't show East Pakistan there, but the western bit of Pakistan is this. And every single time that we see a map of Pakistan, we actually see all of it. Well, all of it wasn't there because not even one princely state had acceded to Pakistan. So all the gaps that you can see there, uh, so the whole big gap, the gaping hole practically in Balochistan is the princely state of uh, of. Uh, the small hole in Sindh is the princely state of Khairpur. Um, and then, of course, in the Punjab, it's Bhavalpur, and then Deer Swat, Chitral, and Am, Ben Hunsa, and Nagar in the north. So you could see that for the actual, the quite literal putting together of Pakistan, or as Aisha Jalal has said, the conjuring of the state, uh, a lot of effort really had to be made. And Pakistan would have been half its size if these princely states had not had actually not come in. Um, and what was really fascinating is that in India, where a large mid mid majority had acceded to India by the 15th of August, uh, none of the princely states in Pakistan had acceded to it. Um, and some even uh, might have uh, gone over to India. And at least with Deer, uh, they were seriously contemplating going over to Afghanistan. And of course, Kalat, as actually Habiz knows more about that, uh, Balochistan wanted to remain inde independent, so there, there is a whole, there's a whole chapter in there. And to uh, go to what uh, Habiz asked, uh, the, one of the reasons why I actually wanted to work on this was the point that we always know, oh, oh it's the Muslim League, Muslim League in Pakistan Banaya because all the Muslims want, want, wanted it. Well, here you have half of the landmass of Pakistan uh, that is not participant in the whole freedom struggle, as we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened there? You know, that was my main, you know, first first question. And when I looked through that, and that really comes out in the book also, is the non-Muslim League story of Pakistan. So and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Bahawalpur, which has pretty well integrated into Pakistan, when it was asked to take refugees in 1947, the government of Bahawalpur, the prime minister who ended up becoming actually the interior minister in the government of Pakistan, uh, Mushtaq Gurmani, he sent a letter to the government of Pakistan saying, we do not want these refugees uh, because you asked for partition and for a separate country, we didn't. So here you have, you know, one of the premier Muslim uh, uh, princely states actually saying, well, it's your, your business. You asked for partition. You asked for Pakistan. And why are you asking us to accept 100,000 refugees? We don't want anything to, to do with them. Uh, none of the princely states that became a part of Pakistan had any presence of the Muslim League. Uh, there was an all states, there was an all India states Muslim League that existed on paper. Uh, but it had zero presence anywhere. And the only presence of any political party uh, in the princely states were parties affiliated with the Indian National Congress. So Kalat had the Kalat State National Party that was very popular at that time, and it was affiliated with the All India Congress. So here you again have this very bizarre thing where Kalat is a 98% you know, Muslim majority princely state, and the only political party of consequence there 
is a member, um, is affiliated to the All India, uh, the, to the Indian National Congress. So it gave a very different kind of a picture about how Pakistan was pieced together. Um, and as also Prof Professor Metcalf said, it has serious implications on the consolidation of the country. Uh, because whereas in India, the idea was that as soon as the princes join India, they need to democratize, they they need to give full rights. That idea was really not present in Pakistan. And I have this very interesting, I think, quote at the beginning of chapter four or five, where even Major General Sikandar Mirza, as Interior Minister, uh, says this very interesting thing. So he's uh, speaking to the New York Times on the 3rd of November, 1954. And this is what he says, and I quote, democracy has to be controlled. We have to save people from themselves. <laughs> so this was a maxim that yeah, I think I well, think that's a very important quote. I yes. think it reveals the thinking of Pakistani establishment very clearly. Very early also. Uh, and in the same way, you know, as Professor um, Aisha Jalal, like, again, has argued in the State of Martial Rule and other works, uh, that the bureaucracy and the, um, and the military took over very early. What was shocking for, for me was, it was as early as the creation of the country, because all the negotiations with the princely states was done solely through the civil service. And by the 1st of July 1948, the ministry that was created for the, uh, for the princely states, and that's again half of Pakistan, uh, Western Pakistan, was directly under the Governor General, Jena, and was headed by uh, a civil service officer who was practically in con control. So right at the beginning of the country, you've given half of the country's administration to the bureaucracy and to the military because the military very soon came, came in because all these places were on the borders, except for, I think, uh, Swat and Amb. Uh, every other princely state was on the border and very critical borders. So the military came in very quickly. The politicians were deliberately kept out. And it's really fascinating. Uh, there is an interesting quote in there from Liaquat Ali Khan where uh, people are, are clamoring for re reforms within the, some of the princely states. And uh, these people claim that they are a part of the Muslim League. And Liaquat Ali Khan actually uh, says in Parliament that we have got nothing to do with these pe people. Uh, we have nothing to do with, the, with reform in the princely states, and that can take its own pace. Uh, so it's a very bizarre kind of an, you know, how are you going to build a country where you actually do not want to demo democratize uh, about half of it? Uh, but then, of course, they are that exception, and um, I had wished that Mir Mehdi, uh, uh, Prince of uh, Kherpur, uh, would have been here, but he's a bit ill, so, so, so he can't come. Uh, but Kherpur, uh, you know, struck a different chord. The first elections in Pakistan on universal adult franchise were not in a province of Pakistan, were in Kherpur state. And this is very fascinating because in 1946, when the resident of Punjab states visited Kherpur, he actually called, called it, quote, Jungli. So 46 May, it was jungly, and by 49, it actually had universal adult franchise. So they grew by leaps and bounds. And, you know, Kherpur, um, and I've uh, tra traced it quite a bit in the, in the book, uh, developed quite a lot uh, because the prince was quite enlightened. It ended up having a very good chief, chief, chief minister. And as a small state, uh, it actually did develop till it was merged uh, into the one unit. So... I think you know this first the first decade of Pakistan is uh, as again you know as Aisha Jalal has also argued is that critical uh, part where um, a lot of things uh, were set in stone a lot of the mold that Pakistan later followed uh, was sort of you know uh, uh, fine fine tuned during this early period and the princess states really had a lot to do with this you know uh, Baloch insurgency is from the fact that a lot of Baloch leaders don't accept uh, the accession of uh, Kalat to Pakistan, a lot of the frontier, a lot of the of the of the troubles on the um, on the frontier border were related to the fact that Deer wanted to accede to India. And I used to always have this very funny occasion because the Nawab of Deer used to live right across uh, the road from my house in 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 Lahore, and he was under house arrest for about 20 years or or something. Uh, but when he was old, I used to go and speak speak to him and once he said nee, nee, mene toh, but, uh, I never wanted to accede to uh, Afghanistan and you know uh, I had no relations with them uh, and of course I was doing my PhD research at that time and I found letters by, by him to the Afghan king saying <laughs> we want to join you so I brought it to him and said didn't you write this and he's like ah, but you know I was young and people write let letters when they're young that doesn't mean much <laughs> 
but a lot of Pakhtunistan, you know, again related to the fact that, that they really wanted to 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 uh, raise up that issue and su support it. So these things, you know, remain and and even now, you know, and, and that tells you how much people read academic books. Uh, you know, when the whole CPEC thing came up, uh, all of a sudden I was I was called in by a number of uh, my journalist friends because, of course, C the 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 China Pakistan Economic Corridor comes through the uh, erstwhile states of Hunza and Nagar, um, which actually were never under Kashmir. And it so happened, and I've uh, also tra traced that in the, in the book, uh, that the notification that they were independent of Kashmir was actually given to the Kashmir government, but the Kashmir government kept silent on it and didn't tell anyone. But that doesn't mean that they weren't ind independent of it. And in the India office, it was filed under a file of Chitral. So everyone who actually tried to find it just couldn't because it just wasn't there in the right file. But just because I was working on Chitral and Hunza and, and, and Nagar, because and I actually ba Some Babu in his infinite wisdom decided to. Decided that <laughs> it should go there. And I still remember when I found that, I called up uh, Mir Barkat Ali Khan, who was uh, uh, the Mir of uh, Nagar. Uh, he was at that time our deputy ambassador in in Jordan, and I remember calling him up and telling him, Jim, that, and he actually practically fell from his chair. And he said, no one told us that. And I was like, yes, I know, no one did. Uh, so you know, there are a lot of interesting things that, that really come up there. You know, a lot of Gilgit that, that we have, a very small part of it really was a part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Very tiny part. The rest of it was actually tribal area that quite legally exceeded to Pakistan. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the things are, of course, of the past, but a lot of them are very current, you know, the whole uh, Saraiki Suba thing, you know, that comes in from the restoration of the Bhavalpur Suba movement in, in the 1970s. So there's a lot of uh, uh, what had happened in the past still affecting us. And I think, you know, I haven't done any uh, sociological work, work on this, but uh, since I've visited all the princely states, a lot of the processes through which, you know, pe pe people live, view the past, uh, are viewing the future and the and the present. A lot of that uh, really has to do with their princely state past. And you know, if you go to go to Swat, um, everyone talks about the time of 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 the Wali now. So you know, there is a very good anthropological Thank aspect you. of it which uh, I haven't even uh, touched. Uh, uh, which Mangesh, is there. we have. Uh, I must interrupt. Running out of time. <laughs> we are running uh, running out of time, and we have just Should a couple of minutes uh, to open the floor for a uh, couple questions. So um, if I may, there is the gentleman there right here. Uh, here, on this side, the ge gentleman on the left uh, with the Chitrali cap. <laughs> <laughs> and then the gentleman in the back after that. Um, thank you very much. I, I really look forward to reading this book. Um, I was actually in Kherpur not so long ago with some students of architecture. I'm an art historian myself, an historian of architecture, and um, only because I actually was um, in kindergarten with the kids, who, the Talpur kids at the time, that I had the opportunity of actually looking at some of the pictures when the military entered um, Kherpur. And you know, it was really quite shocking that it happened so late. Um, I think it was 1955. Five. Uh, five, yeah. And, and um, the, the current sort of prince, within quotes I say, um, is living a very strange and sequestered life in crumbling palaces. Um, it was shocking for me as a historian of architect to see that the state, the, the federal government, of course, is completely oblivious to this question of heritage and naturally to this question of uh, history. Could you ask the question, sir? Now, my question is, um, why? Yeah, I mean, it's... it's the, the, we, the Aga Khan came into Chitral and, you know, has done work on heritage. Did you get a sense that there is actually a conscious effort towards erasure that is now making itself evident in the architecture and its neglect? Uh, can we take one yes. more question? And then. Uh, I'm Dr. Khawar Mehdi and uh, with reference to the accession instrument, wouldn't it be correct to say that more than being an instrument of accession, it was an instrument not of choice, but of coercion, pressure, and outright bullying, to be specific. And with reference to the bureaucracy, as you just mentioned, how they started, uh, you know, ha having a hands-on approach with reference to the accession, Jinnah Saab set the course early on. Hmm. So they were only following what Jinnah had decided. They were not doing out of their own accord. 
Thank you. And uh, could you also explain this last question with reference to, you know, the Kalat, right? If I, because you make a point that, you know, people blame the bureaucracy and the military, but it was they were acting on the instructions of Mr. Janai himself. Oh, yes. Um, I, I think you're very, very right. Like, now I'm actually working on, on the government of Pakistan side uh, for my next next book, the first 10 years. And it's very clear that uh, Janai set, set the mold very early. You know, you just look at the first cabinet of Pakistan, the most important positions go to bureaucrats. The finance minister is a is a is a career civil servant, and the and, and the foreign minister also. So he he doesn't really trust pol politicians to begin with, um, and he actually gave power to the to the bureaucrats very quickly. And the bureaucrats, being old old hands, knew how to deal with them. You know the the, the whole Kalat thing. It's uh, very complicated to to explain here, uh, but practically they were tricked into accession. Uh, and the and the, and the trick was actually you know uh, at the instigation of Jinnah and uh, um, a lot of the bureaucracy there, um, a lot of the princes were actually forced you know and this begins from Lord Mount Mountbatten where he practically you know asked them to sign their, their own death warrants, mm -hmm. um, and I must say here you know one of the things that a lot of people say that oh gee ye princely states they and they should have ended well a lot of them uh, as of course uh, Professor Metcalf also mentioned. Uh, a lot of them were doing really well. You had princely states like Baroda, like Gwalior, Travancore, Cochin, even Hyderabad in some ways, really far ahead of British India. And it is now in hindsight that we are saying, Ki, Achha ji, you know, they all ended. Uh, but you know, um, Monaco is still a state in the world. We have states like Belgium, you know, uh, 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 Hyderabad was as large as Spain. So it was a huge territory and it was a huge country. It had its own currency. So to now to say that Neji, wo, matlab, you know, it was impossible for that to happen. Well, a lot of Europe shouldn't have happened then, you know, and it should have all been the Holy Roman Empire, perhaps. Uh, so in hindsight, we sort of, you know, undermine them. But in but in practicality, I th I think uh, there was a lot of a lot of currency there. And just to answer your 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 question, I think now the government isn't really interested because they just think, eh, okay, they've been there, done that. Uh, but again, as Professor Metcalf also pointed out, it's very interesting that the government does have a sense that we owe them something. So when their privy purse was increased by 200% in, uh, in, in 2009, no one said anything. And it was just passed. And just imagine if this were being even discussed in India, uh, you know, there'll be an uproar in parliament and there'll be a revolt in parliament, actually, for that matter. And, I'd, and I think probably the person who would present that, that uh, bill would be practically literally thrown out of parliament. Uh, but this passed in, 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 in Pakistan without a comment. Um, and it didn't even come in come in the news. So people think that this perhaps owes something to them, but they need to be sitting in their palaces, crumbling or whatever. Um, and that, of course, has very bad implications. You know, Kherpur, Bhavalpur, um, even uh, Deer and Chitral, they have a lot of architectural heritage and, you know, a lot of things that really uh, can be harnessed and worked upon. But, you know, that's really not, not done. Um, thank you very much. I think we have uh, run out of time. We are well over time and uh, I will conclude this session by thanking both of our uh, guests to, together and uh, you can buy a copy of Princely Affair uh, from OUP. It's there. Yes. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.